The scripture reading today is from Matthew 25, 14 to 30, the parable of the valuable coins. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who was leaving on a trip. He called his servants and handed his possessions over to them. To one he gave five valuable coins, and to another he gave two, and to another he gave one. He gave each of the servant according to that servant's ability. Then he left on his journey. After the man left, the servant who had five valuable coins took them and went to work doing business with them. He gained five more. In the same way, the one who had two valuable coins gained two more. But the servant who had received the one valuable coin dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five valuable coins came forward with five additional coins. He said, Master, you gave me five valuable coins. Look, I have gained five more. His master replied, Excellent. You are a good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, and I'll put you in charge of much more. Come, celebrate with me. The second servant also came forward. Master, you gave me two valuable coins. Look, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done. You are a good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I'll put you in charge of much. Come, celebrate with me. Now the one who had received the one valuable coin came forward. Master, I knew you are a hard man. You harvest grain where you haven't sown. You gather crops where you haven't spread seed. So I was afraid, and I hid my valuable coin in the ground. Here, you have what's yours. His master replied, you evil and lazy servant. You knew I harvested grain where I hadn't sown, and that I gathered crops where I hadn't spread seed. And in that case, you should have turned my money over to the banker so that when I return, you could give me what belonged to me with interest. Therefore, take from him the valuable coin and give it to the one who has ten coins. Those who have much will receive much more, and they will have more than they need. But as for those who don't have much, even the little bit they have will be taken away from them. Now take the worthless servant and throw him out into the farthest darkness. People there will be weeping and grinding their teeth. Amen. So a bit over a decade ago, under a different presidency in what feels like a different world, a good-looking, younger president, with skin the color of coffee latte, engendered a bit of controversy when he gave a speech on a campaign trail in his second term, for his second term. In the speech he said, and I quote, if you've been successful, you didn't get there on your own. If you were successful, somebody along the way gave you some help. There was a great teacher somewhere in your life Somebody helped create this unbelievable American system that helped you to thrive. Somebody invested in roads and bridges. If you've got a business, you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. That last sentence, of course, found its way onto every talking point memo and every newscast of the legions of talking heads in the opposing party and blasted through the end of the campaign. And sure enough, a few days later, when that president arrived in Florida, he was welcomed with 13 electronic billboards, billboard ads featuring small business owners declaring, Mr. President, I built this. Do you all remember that? 
I even remember seeing similar billboards erected on the side of the Illinois Tollway as I drove home from Chicago in front of one of the big construction companies. I always wondered if that last sentence was a bit of a gaffe. I mean, if he had just added two words to that sentence, something like, if you've got a business, you didn't build that alone. Somebody else helped to make that happen. It might not have been quite so quotable by his opponents. But regardless of the controversy from that last sentence, that sentiment, I think, is undeniable. None of us do anything completely alone. And often we are making something out of what someone else gave us or made the way for us. We were born into a certain set of circumstances, and we hope to build upon those circumstances something greater for ourselves, for our loved ones, and for our community. But it's never ours alone, and you can't really keep it for yourself or take it with you when this life is over. <coughs> I'm sorry, I still have this naggy cough, but I'm getting there. Today's scripture is, well, is a well-known parable of the talents, that talent being noted in this translation as a valuable coin. Here at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, it is the third parable in a series of four regarding how to, conti how to continue living after Jesus leaves and how to await his return. Now, if you've spent any amount of time in church over the last years, you've probably heard a sermon preached on this scripture. No doubt you've heard a sermon preached about stewardship on this scripture. You might even have heard me preach a sermon on stewardship from this scripture. I believe there's even been a talent fundraiser here at KCUCC in the past based on this scripture. But this passage is like a perfect trap for pastors. I mean, it's a happy accident that the ancient word talent or talenta can be conflated with some sort of skill or gift that inflates the meaning of the parable for us, and all of us pastors can do our little footwork and our pivoting to talk about your time and your talents in addition to your money and how those all contribute to our church in our stewardship season. But then we get to that last section, that section with the third servant who gets thrown into the outer darkness with the gnashing of teeth simply because he held on to and gave back what the master gave him without gaining anything extra. And then we have fallen into that capitalistic pro prosperity gospel trap, somehow demonizing those who aren't money makers or hedge fund managers in our church. Oops, that's not what I meant. The thing is, that stewardship scenario, that stewardship sermon that's been given so many times, tends to overlook what is perhaps the most important thing in this scripture. There is a greater point that we learn from the get-go in this passage. Each of these coins, these extremely valuable coins, are given freely to these servants. None of it was theirs to begin with. And of course, the return on their investment goes back to the master because... None of it was theirs to begin with. The true meaning of the word talenta, or talent in this parable, comes from the word talenta, and it was a coin in ancient Palestine that would be the equivalent of a few hundred thousand dollars today. It's an astronomical amount of money to be in one coin. It's part of this hyperbolic absurdity that we've been talking about in the Gospel of Matthew, that Jesus is telling a parable with a master who has freely given one or two or five coins worth 15 to 20 years of the wages of the person they gave it to. Any ancient listener in this parable would immediately know that that master handed that servant a coin or two or five worth more than any of them could ever hope to earn in a lifetime. And then he expects something to be done with that money. <coughs> In the frame of the allegory, if this story is about the disciples, or maybe about us, the most important point is that God has given them, or us, an astronomical amount. 
an unimaginable amount to do with as we will, to hopefully grow, to turn over, to draw out, to massage the value of it, to mold it and shape it and form it into something productive, something that manifests our gifts into something greater. But none of it is ours to begin with. We always think that we never have enough. We, ha had never, we never have enough time. We never have enough money. We never have enough talents or abilities. But if we look at our lives as a gift from God, that changes things. What God has given you is not just enough. It is astronomically more than enough. It may sound absurd to say that what you have, what God has given you, is the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars or 20 years of wages. You may think, nah, I'm not that talented. I'm definitely not worth that much. But that's not how Jesus is seeing it when he talks to his disciples. And that's not how God sees you. And that's not how God sees us. What we have here is abundance. We have abundance. We are blessed with abundance all around us. The abundance of education. The abundance of success. The abundance of food and friends and this beautiful setting, this wonderful city, our fortunate births. The abundance of good choices. The abundance of creativity and goodwill and welcome and generosity. In this life, in this day and age, in this community, in this congregation, we have great abundance. And so the question becomes, what are we going to do with it? What are you going to do with what God has given you? Because it was never ours to begin with, and it won't be ours to end with. But in the time that we have it, in the time that we steward it, we care for it, and we need a purpose for it. And our purpose is to do kingdom work for God. If you've been given privilege or honor or power or a place in society, if you've been given blessings and abundance in life with your own blood, sweat, and tears and a little good fortune mixed in, you should be doing something to improve society with what you've been given. And Jesus drives this home in the fourth story, the one that comes after this series. That is the famous scripture that asks, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and didn't do anything to help you? And he says... Surely as you've done for the least of these, you did it for me. Jesus is asking us to take our time and our resources, our talents and our money, to help build the kingdom of God, where no one is left out, no one is left behind, no one is left hungry or thirsty or unsheltered or alone. We've been entrusted with power and privilege, and know-how, and insight. What will we do with our abundance? What will we do with what we've been given? The other thing, the second thing that I think too often gets missed in this scripture because we get so fixated on that third servant, is the invitation that comes after the master receives his return from the two servants that do invest. When the master returns and gets his report on his coins, his invitation and his generosity become even greater. Well done, he says to the first and the second. You are good and faithful. You have been faithful over little. I will put you in charge of much. Come and celebrate with me. To paraphrase, God says, good job. You are now my partner. Come, partner, and join in my celebration. Now you are my partner. Come and celebrate with me. God is telling them that they are partners in God's kingdom-building work, a collaborator. Last week, 
we talked about clearing out our internal cobwebs to be ready to collaborate with God when we hear the call. And today's scripture, we hear tales of celebrations that come when you do collaborate with God. And isn't a celebration sweeter when you are a contributor? I mean, think about it. What are we doing this week? We're all going to a Thanksgiving somewhere, hopefully. And being invited to a Thanksgiving is wonderful. It's food and fellowship and generosity. But I find being a guest at Thanksgiving and bringing your own dish puts it up just a notch, doesn't it? With your dish, maybe you're bringing your favorite food. Maybe you're sharing a recipe for cranberry sauce that you know can't be beat. Maybe you can brag on your grandmother's best cornbread or show off your amazing pie-making skills. At my Thanksgiving gathering, I've been asked to bring a salad. And I, I kind of think that was the boring thing. They thought, you're extra, bring a salad. They don't know that I've got incredibly good salad games. My salad game is strong. I've already looked at websites and considered multiple salad entrees. It's going to be good. And as we look out over our delicious Thanksgiving tables and we see that delicious blend of family history and recipes handed down or across or shared over of ethnicities and distance and time, it gives us a mouth-watering tableau of flavor. When you are a collaborator, you have invested. You have some skin in the game. You have pride in what comes from it. You have ownership. You ha as a collaborator, everything that comes after is a return on your investment as well. Is this not the exact reason that our Chris Kindle market is such a driving force of joy here every year? Is this not how Randall can get away coming up here and bossing you all around for several <laughs> months on end? I mean, every year we all become collaborators this one weekend of fostering the kingdom of God, partners in, with God in bringing joy to ourselves and to our community. This congregation pours its heart and its soul, its time and its talents and its resources and its organization, and let's not forget its money, into an incredible weekend. And it feels so very good because of all that investment we put into it. I think of all the people who come through our doors, we are the ones that are the happiest during KKM. Because in that process, you find yourself celebrating something about yourself, your cookie recipe. I've looked up cookie recipes too, by the way. Bring in some game there or your new system to stream, streamline the food line or to put up the, the new curtains, or your artistry in the decorating, or your idea that was a huge hit, your gifts and ours and mine that will be utilized in this one big collaborative event that will be a delight to thousands. But the celebration will be sweeter for us because we invested in that process. Our lives are made rich and satisfying because of those celebrations, those sweet moments when we know we collaborated to make something great. And our return on our investment is so much greater because others invested with us too. And so we learn that the greatest risk of all is not to risk anything, not to care deeply or profoundly enough about anything to invest that deeply, not to give your heart away for the greater good, is a much bigger risk in this life. This scripture seems to be saying that to play it too safe, to live too cautiously, is to miss the celebration that comes after we give of ourselves so generously. A decade ago, later in that speech, that brown-skinned president concluded his remarks by saying this. The point is, when we succeed, we succeed because of our individual initiative, but also because we do things together. We say to ourselves, ever since the founding of this country, there are some things that we do better together. There are many things we do better together, and God is waiting on us to collaborate. So let's look to our church as a way 
that we can do kingdom work in this world. We have abundance here. Why not invest in our church and invest deeply and open ourselves up to the collaboration with God that brings back a much greater return on our investment? Why not invest in this year's stewardship drive to give us a budget next year that anticipates a great celebration later? We have abundance here. And that abundance isn't ours to keep. It wasn't ours to begin with, and it won't be ours in the end. But what type of kingdom building are we going to do with it in the meantime? Let us find out. Amen.